Ooh, man, this is a doozy. This is one of the ones that uh, we <laughs> we predicted nihilistically would become incredibly normalized. Remember all these years ago, facial recognition? Oh, absolutely. When it was just sort of like a glint in the eye of, of the Zuckster, you know, I mean, like uh, it was about like, oh, no, we're scared that they're using facial recognition on our Facebook pictures. But now we're actively feeding these AI apps like Lenza, you know, our data so that they can improve facial recognition and recreation algorithms. Yeah. And this is really an exploration of the tech that's making it work, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we brought on Jonathan Strickland, our buddy from Tech Stuff, to really go through all of that minutia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to listen back along with you to see uh, just how our predictions evened out. So hope you enjoy it and uh, think about who gets to look at your face. <laughs> from UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. They call me Ben. You are you. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Listeners, you're probably wondering, uh, whatever happened to the other guy on the show? Don't worry. Our third amigo, Noel, will be back in due time. Today, however, we pulled a switcheroo on you. You see, this is not the ordinary episode of Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. Today, we are joined by a very special and returning guest, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our resident tech expert, Jonathan Strickland. I'd like to think this is an extraordinary episode of Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. And uh, I am here to talk about stuff they legit do not want you to know. That's true. That's true, Jonathan. Thank you for coming. You know, one thing, one thing that we can say about Jonathan off the bat is that he has a face that is more recognizable than most. You host a show called Tech Stuff. You host a show called Forward Thinking. You've worked with everyday science on brain stuff, and you regularly uh, hit the streets on CES and E3. Mm -hmm. Yep, these are all true. I, I often will get, maybe not often, but frequently enough get recognized simply because my face has been in a lot of places and associated directly with my identity. It's not just that, hey, who's that guy in the background of every Avengers movie or whatever. I'm someone who my face is tied to who I am frequently enough that people recognize me for the person I am. Uh, most people, I would argue, probably don't experience that to any great degree apart from, you know, their their close friends and acquaintances, sure. that sort of thing. And their exes or whatever. And their exes, yeah. The <laughs> enemies that they have ranked up. As people may or may not be aware, Ben and I are longtime enemies. Yes. I declared you as such within my first couple of months of working at How Stuff Works. Well, yeah, but also to be fair, I push people. Matt can attest to that. <laughs> so most people would think – there's not a real great chance they would be recognized whenever they go out in public. But here's an interesting fact that you may or may not know. In the United States, one out of every two adults is actually uh, – their face is actually tied to their identity in some law enforcement's database. That law enforcement uh, agency might be local, might be federal – most of them are linked together loosely in the sense that if one law enforcement agency wants to run a uh, a recognition uh, test on a suspect photo, they can get that done within other law enforcement agencies. So you can, in theory, have half of the adult population of the United States as your virtual lineup when you are looking for a match on a photo. So if you are an adult in the United States, there's a coin flip chance that your face is in one of these databases. If you committed a crime or if you've been accused of committing a crime uh -huh. in the United States, there's essentially a 100% chance that your face I is in one of these databases. So that's what we're talking about today, ladies and gentlemen. You'll remember at the close of our previous episode, we asked you to consider how many times your face has appeared on a camera. 
right? How many times a day does a camera perceive your visage? Uh, I would argue that a lot of people don't want to be recognized casually for sure. one reason or another. Uh, perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal reasons. Right. Yeah. Sure. I, if, if I'm – if I'm walking around a place and I just want to duck into a store, I don't necessarily want the entire world to know that I went into that store. Let's say that I'm shopping for a surprise gift for my wife. Totally innocent. Nothing wrong about that. Then I don't necessarily want that information to get back to my wife and thus ruin the surprise. <laughs> or okay. it could be it could be anything uh, that you would argue is on the further end of the spectrum at any rate. We have a certain uh, expectation of privacy in here in the United States that I think is largely based off of wishful thinking at this point. So what is now philosophical yeah. waxing about privacy or the nature of it or how long it's existed is uh, – is sort of a hobby of yeah. Matt and I on the show. Uh, I guess we should start, as the Mad Hatter said, at the beginning. Sure. So what what do we mean when we say facial recognition? What What is this? So this was something that uh, people were starting to work on very seriously in the 90s and early 2000s because it required a great deal of processing power back in those days to achieve what now we can do much more simply with new types of computer architecture. But your basic uh, approach has been the same, which is that you create a program, an algorithm, that identifies special anchor points on an image, such as a face, and identifies this looks like an eye. So I'm going to assume that this is an eye. So here's the other eye. Here's the nose. Here's the mouth. Based upon the relationship of these various components within a face, I would uh, assign a numeric value, more or less a numeric value, to this, it's called a face print, but it's essentially the sum total of all the different uh, features that that particular algorithm is looking for. And just to get this out of the way, there are a lot of different algorithms out there made okay. by a lot of different companies. So not everyone does it exactly the same way. Everyone claims that theirs is the best, but they all use similar but not identical methods. You then take this information, this face print, this numeric value you have uh -huh. created. And you run it against a database of previous face prints that are tied to known individuals. So the picture you take is called a probe photo. That is the photo you are probing the database to see if you can find a match. All right. You look and see if you find a close numeric match between the two, uh, the probe photo and all of your, your collected images that are in your database that okay. you have, you know who those belong to. So, Photo, uh, probe photo is of a person of interest. Might not be a suspect, but it's certainly someone you would like to talk to if you had a chance because they're involved in a investigation in some way. Sure. You look the, uh, against the database. You try and find a match numerically at that point, at least with most systems, but not with all. You would then have a human being, a real life person, comparing these images to each other to see if they actually represent a match of this photo looks like, yes, it is, in fact, the person who's in the database. Because people can look very similar. People can look very similar. And but depending upon how the algorithm breaks down the face, yeah. it may mistakenly think that two people are the same, even if you were to look at them in person and say, well, that's clearly not the same person. I mean, I can tell that's not the same person. Right. There are times where that happens. Uh, it also has a lot of other factors, such as the picture you take is the person facing face on to the camera. If it's at a slight angle, that changes things as well, right? Uh -huh. uh, there have been advances in algorithms where it's able to take better guesses as to the three dimensionality of a face. Yeah. But previously, it was very much a two dimensional image, which meant that you could fool it. Uh, you could fool it either on purpose or by accident. So this doesn't have to do with law enforcement. But in mm. Japan, uh -huh. they incorporated facial recognition software in vending machines that sold cigarettes because the idea was that if you appeared to be too young, the vending machine wouldn't sell cigarettes to you. But if you just held up a photo 
<laughs> of someone who was old enough to purchase no cigarettes. Way. It could because it couldn't detect depth. Yeah, so it, could, so it was entirely just two dimensional. Right. Is this a face of a person over what is it, eighteen or whatever? Right. And now it's gotten to a point where. Because of camera sophistication, there are a lot of cameras that can incorporate two lenses, which gives it that that uh, bi optic view, a parallax view that can Depth simulate. Of field. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can simulate that three dimensional vision, and there are algorithms that can take advantage of that. Uh, that has been decreased somewhat. It is not as easy to fool at least a sophisticated machine, no. but it can still happen. Now, earlier at the at the very beginning, yeah. Uh, you gave everybody a a pretty harrowing statistic. Yeah. The 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 what, what did you call a coin flip chance? Yes, there's a coin flip chance that if you are an adult in the U.S., your face is in one of these databases. If you've never done anything wrong, yeah, you don't have to do anything. Well, really, all you have to have done is applied for some sort of license or mm-hmm. uh, accreditation that also includes your photo. It's like so a passport, passport, a driver's license, state ID. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of security clearances that do this. Yeah. So let, let's back up a little bit okay. and, and let me explain the landscape because it is complicated, right? It's not as simple as there's this one massive computer system at Langley and that's where your face is. It, it's much more distributed than that, much like the Internet itself. So the FBI has the interstate photo system. This was sort of a an evolution of their national fingerprint database. And I think you would say, all right, well, I understand the fingerprint database. They've collected fingerprints from various criminal investigations. This speeds things along when they are investigating a new crime. This, however, is more about faces, less about fingerprints. Uh So now what we're looking at is a system where if the FBI uses their normal method of operations – in theory, at least, you probably would feel a little less creepy about all this. And that's because if they're using their basic method of running a search, what the FBI would do is take a probe photo from an investigation. Right, the search photo. They would then run it against their database, which includes both criminal and civil photos. The civil photos, some of those are tied to some of the criminal photos. If they have the same picture of a person from a criminal investigation and from, say, a license that they had applied for, yeah, that, then both of those will be tied together in the database. When they run a search, the search only looks for matches in the criminal side. It cannot look for matches on the civil side. So if your idea is in the FBI's uh, interstate photo system uh-huh. – but it's only in there as an example of a, a civil photo and you have no criminal record to tie it to, it should not pull you as a result. So this leads to an immediate question. When we're yep. talking about the division between civil and criminal mm-hmm. uh, images here, mm-hmm. facial images, at least as it pertains to the FBI, do they not automatically correlate because of a matter of – Ability or because of a matter of legislation? They do it as a policy saying we we don't want to okay. – we don't want to bring in the civil photos. Trust us. But this was the basic search. I haven't gotten to their other search. And we'll dive into that after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> And we're back. So for everybody who is just now becoming acquainted with this, we've we've heard all of this stuff. People have seen like crime shows, CSI or whatever, and and, uh, facial recognition and action films and facial recognition in science fiction. And what we've talked about so far. Yeah. Is a basic search. We've explained the technology Mm -hmm. and we've explained a little bit about the evolution. I Mm -hmm. think it would surprise people how quickly this has evolved. Oh, sure. Uh, Yeah. But what's after the basic search? So, all right. The FBI's general MO is using this, this criminal database and uh, avoiding the civil database, uh, when they're doing their own searches, but they also have a division called the facial analysis comparison and evaluation services or faces 
Uh, if you want to do the acronym. <laughs> Faces is kind of like their, their specialty division where they want to run a more, uh, a more extensive search. So the faces operators can run a search about that, that incorporates both criminal and civil, uh, sources and they can work with local state law enforcement agencies. Well, not just state, but tribal law enforcement agencies as well in the United oh, States. Okay. They, they have, uh, a, a, they have this ability to work with all of them, to partner with them. Um, it's kind of a tit for tat sort of approach. Whenever anyone needs to run one of these, they can run it up the chain and see if they can get a bigger net to, to pull from, right? Yeah. So what will happen is you would send a request to the faces department. They could run it against not only the FBI's database, which is – it's extensive, but it does, robust. that is not the one in every two Americans database. It's, okay. the, that, that statistic comes from the collection of databases across the United States at all different levels of law enforcement. So again, state, tribal, city, uh, federal, all of those different levels combined, that's where you get the one and two. But the FBI essentially has access to most of that. Because of these relationships they've developed with the various other entities. So you would send a request to FACES. FACES would then handle the uh, request sent out to other agencies, right? So within they would do the, the FBI search, but they would also say, hey, state of Utah, can you do this search? City of Las Vegas, can you do this search? You know what? We're going to expand this. California, can you do this search? And you start, again, casting a wider net. Well, you start running into problems very, very quickly with this approach. How so? Well, multiple, multiple avenues. Let's start with technology. Right. You remember earlier I mentioned that no, no facial recognition algorithm does the approach the exact same way as a different one, right? Like, they, right. So it's not like there's just one way to achieve facial recognition technology and some may be better than others and the real problem is that we don't really know because most of these companies haven't had a third party come in and evaluate the software for accuracy so there's no um there's no quality assurance there's no accountability okay. at all so one from a technology standpoint you cannot be certain that everyone is on the same playing ground like they're right. on the same level they may all be using different technologies some of which may be more effective than others yeah uh, that's problem number one just to add on to that one of the larger problematic trends in many uh many government agencies attempt to implement technology is the arrival and persistence of outdated legacy stuff because yep. they're locked into some service agreement or contract for or they just don't have budget for yeah, it like yeah, yeah if you're running new. if you're running old servers old computers right. and they aren't capable of running the most up to date versions of of software that's out there then yeah that's yet another layer of technology issues yes so Ladies and gentlemen, if this sounds kind of weird to you, um, one of the one of the moments in American pop culture when the average non-military, non-law enforcement officer person learned about this was actually watching The Wire when they had to use typewriters. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yep. And this is just a, another example of this. So not only are... There are various forms of facial recognition algorithms and technology, mm -hmm. some of which may be proprietary. Mm -hmm. All and, of it is proprietary. And not only do these not all play nice together, I guess, or agree at yeah. times, but some are – I'm overwhelmingly certain some are pretty outmoded. Yeah, effectively obsolete. Some of them are. And – Again, you don't necessarily know unless you are getting regular updates from all the different agencies out there. There are thousands of these law enforcement agencies, right? Uh -huh. Like it's not 
We're not talking about others. Oh, there's 50 of them because there's 50 states. No, there's <laughs> way more than that. Yeah. And you're talking about databases that are not necessarily directly connected to one another. So each one is its own little island with its own little – like some of them may be using the same facial recognition software. Some of them may be using different versions of the same oh, vendor software. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, if, if they all worked, if all the facial recognition software worked flawlessly, this would not be an issue. It wouldn't matter if you went and bought – from company A versus company B, or if you had company A's 1.0 version versus company A's 1.5 version, if they all worked perfectly, that's not an issue. Uh, but we don't know because we haven't had these third party audits for a lot of those technologies. You, you get a lot of claims, like you'll see a company say, we're 95% accurate. And then you say, well, well, where's the proof of that? And they say, well, um, trust us. And then you say, well, can we hold you to that in court? And like, oh no, our terms of service say, you can't, we can't be legally held accountable for the claim that we make that it is 95% accurate. <laughs> oh, wow. That's an issue, right? So that's all technology. There's another technology issue that gets super uncomfortable. What's that? Most of the time, facial recognition software is not equally accurate across all ethnicities because Holy the shit. way people choose these algorithms – and the way they design the faces, the, you know, the facial recognition, uh -huh. the, the the elements that they're looking for, right. it may be that in one ethnicity you see a greater variety of the features that were chosen to right. be the elements that you're looking for versus others. So within one ethnicity, you might see a greater variation in something like cheekbones, let's say. The cheekbone size, the cheekbone, like the prominence, the that ratio sort of stuff. Yeah. To the eye, et that kind of stuff might be really important with or at least there might be a greater variety within one ethnicity and less in another. Well, if your technology is focusing on that and it doesn't focus so much on the other qualities that have a greater variety within a different ethnicity, you're going to get a lot of false positives because the technology you're looking at, if it's looking at a, a, a subject from that ethnicity that doesn't have great representation in your technology, you're going to get a lot of false positive identifications because the tech can, it's like, it's like that, that statement about someone being racist. They cannot tell the difference between two different individuals from the same race. They don't see the difference because they have become so ethnically minded of their own ethnicity, uh -huh. they only recognize the differences that are representative of their respective ethnicity. And this is what's, what's fascinating and terrifying about this. Uh, I, I think the most immediate fascinating and terrifying thing is that we see again that software is limited by the creator. Technology yeah. is, is limited by, it, we all make these amazing tools right. based on our own parameters. We, right? we very quickly make an assumption that something that's that's working on what appears to be cold, hard logic is right. infallible. Right. right. Like yeah. the, that emotion, that things like uh, uh, irrationality mm -hmm. don't play a factor, except for the fact that they played a factor when we made this stuff. And it didn't necessarily come from a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. It may have been something that just in the design elements, people were trying to figure out, all right, well, what components are the ones we need to really focus on in order for our technology to work? And some guy leaned in, took off his clan hood and said, cheekbones. Yeah, that's a very – I mean probably not quite as uh, <laughs> as extreme as that. But the point being that it there have been some some claims at least – I don't know about any deep studies – but okay. claims that facial recognition technology disproportionately affects people of uh, specific ethnicities, mm -hmm. uh, particularly black people. They have been – uh, disproportionately affected by this. With like false positives. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and also there, the, it's, that goes down a road that is far beyond the scope of this episode because we'd have to start talking about the vast gap, uh, in the experience of being, say, a white person in the United States and being the subject of a law enforcement investigation and being a black person. There's, Huge issues there that really go beyond what I'm talking about here. Uh, and I'm not going to jump into that because I'm sure you've covered those sort of things in previous episodes. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can look at the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. They have a website called perpetuallineup.org, and it goes through a lot of what you've been talking about. Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, it's 
it is a real thing. I want to stress that it is a real thing. People sometimes will think that uh, I've, I've encountered people with resistance to it because they don't like the idea of an inherently unfair system. It goes against some of their uh, their own personal values, which I completely understand. But it is a real thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, also, every I'm this is going to be Ben's blanket statement for the episode. I always end up having one. And please write to me if you disagree. All systems are inherently on some level unfair. Yes. Yeah, because systems parse. And we don't have we don't have a perfect way of incorporating every possible life experience and perspective when developing a system. Systems are meant to sort things into different categories. Typically, it's like a bureaucracy. If you know how the bureaucracy works, you can very quickly move through a bureaucracy. But if you don't, your experience is going to be painfully laborious and also I, I, I mean what else can we expect if, if if every system is inherently imperfect we can't even as a species get our collection of people's face pictures right correct and we're pouring uh millions into this let, right let me let me throw Another issue here. Yes. So we had technology. Yeah. It's uh, it's all proprietary. It right. doesn't necessarily work well together. Mm-hmm. It's disproportionately discriminatory. Yep. Uh, leading to not only false positives, but in some cases, wrongful arrest and imprisonment. Sure. And uh, and Ben is about to get a whole lot worse. Yes, you're right. It's time for a word from our sponsor. <laughs> And we return. It wasn't that bad. I, I I actually chuckled a little bit, but it was a tease. Yeah, we, uh, we weren't talking. We weren't talking about the ad break. We were talking about yet another disturbing aspect of the emergence of facial recognition. Yeah, I wish I wish I could say there's only maybe one or two layers left, but honestly, this this it just is a goes very and goes and goes. This is a mire of issues. So. <laughs> Remember I said we have thousands of different agencies, yes. all with various databases, all using various types of facial recognition software. The FBI can tap many of them when doing one of these searches. Um, on top of this, you don't have a, you don't have a lot of regulations in place for most of these agencies on how they use this technology. So there are no rules, which means uh, there's no accountability there either. It means that your face could be pulled into a virtual lineup. Essentially, it could be pulled up as a hit on one of these facial recognition searches. And because many of these places have no rules or regulations, you are not necessarily going to be alerted to this fact. You may not be aware that your face is even there in the first place. Uh-huh. Uh, you, the first you may hear of it. Is if it goes far enough for for an agent to come and come knocking and ask like, hey, uh, your face popped up when we ran this search. We need to talk to you about this thing that you may or may not have any connection to. Uh-huh. You better have an alibi. <laughs> you, you better. So this is incredibly disturbing that because there are no rules and no accountability, you can't as a citizen take any steps because they didn't break rules. The rules didn't exist. Uh, before right. we started They're... recording, I said it's kind of like if there were no laws, I could walk into your house and take whatever I wanted because there's no law against stealing. As long as I have – if might makes right, then this is your time. Because right? there's only policy. Yeah. There's right. there's policy internally for these agencies and even that doesn't match up from agency right. to agency. Yeah. There are 18 states that have memorandums of agreement. Yeah. On this. With the FBI yeah. specifically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and there are more states that they're looking at adding to this all the time. But again, within each individual agency, they may have very different policies. Some of them have been trying to be responsible, right? Some of them have uh, done third party audits of their systems, that sort of thing. That's great. That's at least a step in the right direction. Uh-huh. But until we actually make rules, either at the state or federal level, we don't have any again any accountability if something were to go wrong like how do you complain if there's no rule against it right well one of the policies that some of these agencies have is that 
before you can return results to the FBI uh-huh. or to the investigative agent, it has to first pass through humans who look at the pictures and determine whether or not they make a good match. So each of these agencies also have different agreements as to how many results they will return to whatever agent, right? Like uh, in the FBI, it's, I believe, between two and 50 with the default being 20 results. Okay. But some places they'll be like, no, we, we will send you one or we'll send you two or we'll send you up to 80 results. And then human beings are supposed to cull through these and decide which ones are actually the more uh, uh, likely matches to the one that the computer found. You ready to have your mind blown here, Ben? Let's mm. say. Okay, I'm ready now. All right. Let's say that your picture has come up in uh-huh. one of these investigations. Oh, Let's boy. say that the agency that did it does have this policy that it must be reviewed by a human being before it goes any further. 50% of the time, they're going to make the wrong call. How? The human being. Because this is hard. Mm. It's not just hard for computers. It's hard for people to take. If you're not looking at the exact same photo side by side, if you're looking at a person on a different day from a different angle, from a different distance, under different lighting conditions, wearing different clothing, wearing a different hairstyle, wearing sure. whatever, it's hard. Like, unless you are really familiar with that person. I mean, I've seen pictures of people who look like me where I looked and I thought, I don't remember ever being there. And then as I looked, <laughs> oh, wait, that's not me. I, I yeah. That has happened just to me. Uh, don't beat yourself up. I went home with the wrong girl a couple yeah, times. Yeah, I mean, I, no. I, I've definitely walked into the wrong house, but that's a totally different <laughs> issue. That has nothing to do with my recognition. That just has to do with me not paying attention. That was back before you realized that stealing was against the law. Yeah, you know, <laughs> people need to make these things a little more clear to me. This so, is challenging stuff. It's so tough. it turns out that you people really need to go through a very thorough challenging, difficult training process to become experts Mm -hmm. in matching photos. If you have not done that, and a lot of agencies don't require that level of training, there's a 50% error rate. Wow. So not only could the machines misidentify somebody, the human beings who are meant to be the, the, the checks and balances against such things could make the same mistake. So two bad coin flips, you're in a lineup. You might be matched as someone of interest. Now, you might say, let's say, let's say that you're the kind of person who says, I didn't do anything wrong. What do I have to worry what about? What do I have to worry about? Well, I mean, you're talking about a violation of a basic amendment here, potentially the, the protection against unreasonable search and seizure. You're being searched with no justification. There's no reason for them to search you, but they're going to be looking into you and your background. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you did do something that was of minor significance in the past that maybe, you know, you're sorry for. You did something dumb. You, you are sorry for it. You have reformed. You're not, you know, you, you luckily weren't taken to task for it. I guarantee you, if there's a federal investigation, that's going to be one of the things that pops up. I mean, it's, it's things like, your your life could be ruined mm-hmm. or at least significantly impacted in a negative way for something of minor importance that may have happened in the past that has nothing at all to do with whatever the investigation is. And also, let's let's go a step further here. Sure. So the practice of expunging a criminal conviction. Yeah. Right. It happens a lot yep. with especially with people who commit a crime when they're teenagers right sure that uh whether whether or not that's expunged uh doesn't really matter in today's investigatory climate it's kind of like that game where people pretend the floor is lava yeah and no one steps on the floor wait what do you mean pretend i'm sorry you have to learn about it this way the editorial board the floor is lava over at the editorial department we um we started that joke um it's why we have the carpet tiles ben about two weeks before you got here shut up just kept going Uh, you don't have they're not special shoes man on on the flip side (laughs) 
my hamstrings are amazing. That's now. true. That's true. All right. Uh, so <laughs> we um, we're adding some levity, but we're adding levity well, in a bit of a gallows to. humor way. Yeah, you have to because, uh, and I am not. You know me, Ben. I am not a they're all out to get you kind of guy. No, no. Right? You, uh, you, you endeavor to be as objective as possible when you're discussing anything tech related. I just feel very strongly that this particular practice is uh, dangerous and irresponsible on multiple levels. And I'm not the only one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Congress br- called the FBI – in front of the principal's office back in March 2017 and essentially was saying the same thing. They were saying there's no accountability here. Uh, this is horrifying. It is a, a gross, uh, uh, over, overstepping of your authority. It, uh, it, it is violating people's privacy. Uh, people should have a, a an expectation to not be called into these virtual lineups, even if you never know about it. The fact that it's happening. Is disturbing, right? I wonder if it qualifies under unreasonable search. That and that's one of the arguments. That's Georgetown University has has a great report on this that is very easy to read. Uh, there's also the Government Accountability Office that has an amazing report specifically about the FBI. Georgetown looks at the broader picture. Uh-huh. Uh, Government Accountability Office looks specifically at the FBI's use because it's a federal agency and the government accountability office is also a federal agency. Right. The Georgetown one looks at the broader use of, of facial recognition in law enforcement in general. And they there are some very strong points saying this seems like it violates our protection against unreasonable search and seizure. And that, you know, that that's a huge deal. That's that that's a protection granted to us by the Constitution of the United States. So there's definitely movement in government to push these agencies to develop uh, regulations. And I suspect that if the agencies fail to do so in a timely manner, we will see actual legislative movement in various state and federal governing bodies to codify it at that level, if not at the actual agency level. Uh, and fa- I would prefer it to be codified at the state and federal level right. because I always worry about any group that's allowed to make up its own rules. Yeah. And I, I and I find it optimistic to, to say that someone would limit this ability because we know, for instance, that historically when aggregation of powerful data bases occurs, yep. It, it almost never – just due to the differing paces yeah. of technological evolution and legislative evolution, mm. uh, the it, it almost never is reined back uh, efficiently. I mean like the – like the – right now, if for instance I was – I decided to pull a Edward Snowden or Julian Assange or like what's a good Bond villain? Oh, uh, well, Dr. No. OK, Dr. No. I was like I'm going to do a Dr. No thing. <laughs> or R.S. Goldfinger. Yes, yes. I'm going to do a Dr. No Goldfinger thing. And I'm like, Matt, Jonathan, and I are going to do some some terrible attack on the U.S. Right, from our secret underwater base. Of course. Yeah, I of mean, course. that's where we would do that. I that's, mean, the, the volcano base is nice. But yeah. if you're doing like a world level attack where you're you're legitimately causing vast destruction, you want to be in that underwater base. You genuinely have to be afraid of floor lava in the volcano base. Just, you, you just really you know. do. Those carpet tiles are a lifesaver. So, and your hamstrings do look great. Uh, so what, what would happen though is, uh, I would quickly learn that whatever legislation exists mm-hmm. will not in practice stop, uh, stop the NSA from knowing everything I've done online and from extrapolating in the interest of national security. Yeah. Any other information, the, the FISA courts are for the birds. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me throw one more. Are we making it worse? Yeah. Okay. You want it to be worse. Okay. So, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that idea that if I haven't done anything wrong, I'm all right. Uh huh. Here in the United States, one of the things that we are, 
allowed to do, is protected by the Constitution, is to assemble peacefully in public and express free speech. Yeah. So there has been a fear, justifiably in my mind, that an agency that perhaps has a specific political uh, inclination Sure. Could use such facial recognition software to identify participants in a peaceful protest uh-huh. for later, let us say, discussions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You don't think that's already been done? What I'm here to say is that Georgetown, when they did their report, they asked various agencies about their policies as to the use of facial recognition software. They found out of the 52 agencies that they were able to contact and get a response from, only one has a specific rule against using facial recognition to identify people participating in public demonstrations or free speech in ooh, general. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Only one out of 52 that they asked specifically has a rule against that. So in other Jeez. words, 51 out of 52 have no rule Mm-hmm. It means that if the police were to use it or whatever other law enforcement agency were to use facial recognition, perhaps even in a live feed, because you can do it in video just as well as you could do it in photographs, mm-hmm. to start identifying, to populate a crowd with names and identities who are protesting a particular thing. Let's say it's police brutality, which would be right. very relevant, especially in recent years. That is a legitimate concern that that people's free speech could be uh could be could be violated if you feel like you can't go out there and express your thoughts because you might be unfairly targeted as a result of that that is a violation of your free speech not to mention you know your personal safety depending upon how legit those fears are right so that is incredibly troubling i don't know if you noticed this ben matt maybe you guys don't notice it i've noticed that there've been a couple of protests recently <laughs> yeah i've seen a few definitely like in the last 12 months or so i've seen a few like yes. some some of some of which have had a significant number of participants sure. both on both on different sides of political issues right not just i'm not saying that this is one group targeting one other group i'm saying there are a lot of different parties involved here and right. no matter how this technology is used against whichever group it is used the fact that there are no rules about how to use it is deeply troubling and I would argue fundamentally un-American. I would agree. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, definitely. I've seen the photographs and videos of police filming, using video yeah. cameras to film protests and protesters. Mm-hmm. And I, that makes me very nervous. And honestly, if you're able to get at those images, then you can run that search even if you weren't the one filming it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like one of the elements we didn't really touch on in this and this episode, but that is related is the fact that we have lots of private companies out there that incorporate facial recognition technology as a feature for Mm -hmm. you, for consumers. Right. So Facebook's a great example. You take a picture of someone on Facebook that you're friends with. Facebook will often say, hey, do you want to tag this photo? And they'll even give you the name of the person because their facial recognition software is good enough to let you know, like, oh, well, we're pretty sure this is your buddy, you know, Bob. So you want us to go ahead and tag Bob for you? Well, you know, that on its own as a feature, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But you could imagine that same sort of of deep, deep wealth of data being put to nefarious use under the right circumstances, maybe not by Facebook itself, but perhaps by an entity that forces Facebook to hand that information over. Exactly. And I'm glad you said that because more um, more frightening than law enforcement unfairly targeting people mm-hmm. is the idea of the increasingly gray area the increasingly black box interactions between large data aggregators like Facebook, Google, your yep. local ISP sure. and or internet service provider and the the rest of the alphabet soup yeah. of the federal government, you yeah. know? And it could be anything from the FBI to the NSA to local police department mm-hmm. writes in and to to Facebook and says, "Hey, 
we need to, we think there are these three guys who went to this underwater base off the coast of Redacted and they've they, been posting photos <laughs> in their timeline. And yeah. <laughs> we just want to make sure that these three guys yeah. are the same three guys who did that amazing diamond heist a few <laughs> right. years ago yeah. and they for did. their, for their freeze ray. <laughs> yes. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, hey, do you guys remember BOB, the rapper? Yeah. 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 Airplanes. Oh, you mean Bob? Yeah. Yeah. Bob. Uh, he, he came at us a little while ago, uh, us being the world through social, social media and talked about the earth being flat. And we talked about that. Mm, well, yeah. he thinks that Snapchat is really just collecting blackmail photos of our silly faces doing things. I, uh, I will tell you this. Uh, if you think that the images and video that you take on Snapchat that disappear after 24 hours has truly disappeared. You're absolutely wrong. So wrong. Yeah, no, that exists on a server somewhere. It has to. And then furthermore, and, and I love that we're exploring this part too, because, okay, Facebook, people pile on to Facebook often because it is, you know, diabolical. It's, it's an enormous treats, corporation yeah. that yeah is completely dependent upon users surrendering information about themselves. So due to its very nature as to what it is and how it makes money, it makes money through the fact that people use it and reveal their likes, their dislikes, their, you know, the things that they want. Thus you can serve ads against that. It's very easy for that business model to take a very dark turn without, yeah. without a lot of discipline and policies and and the will to actually uh perform business in an ethical manner and to be completely fair i don't think facebook is run by a bunch of vampiric demons but i do think that it can be very easy to make unethical decisions even without being aware of it when you have that massive amount of data absolutely and it also extends to as you said snapchat and uh i i had an issue when um one of, one of our co-hosts here, Noel, was going through a Pokemon Go phase. Oh, yeah. And I said, don't put the put Pokemon Go camera on me when we're hanging out. So there's always, you know, a, a different Pokemon that's on you. And, of course, being a little bit on the paranoid side, I'm kidding. I'm way deep into that. Well, ben, ben, I mean, you're, I hate to tell you this, but you are a, a Pidgey post. <laughs> I mean, you just got Pidgeys all over you. What do you think they mean when they say catch them all? <laughs> oh, They're talking about all the faces. So uh, yeah. One of the first things I turned off on Pokemon Go, although it was not for fear of, well, there's some concern for privacy because, you know, you're using it in public and there are people all around you. And while you can take photos of people in public, there's nothing illegal against that. I just think it's, you know, rude. So I turned off the camera slash augmented reality part so it just has the animated background as opposed to an actual camera view um and uh but i again i did that not really out of concern of other people but rather because it doesn't drain my battery as fast so it's a selfish reason i wish i could say i was being a really decent human being but really i just didn't want my phone to die but is it really turning your camera off well, I mean, it's not showing it on my screen, whether it's showing it on someone's screen. Oh gosh, I, I guess, I guess what I am doing is consistently giving, uh, Nintendo and the Pokemon Corporation up to date information about who is on the belt line. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's what they need. And it's a shame that they don't pay you. So there, there are a couple things here yeah. that we should, we should explore. So sure. Another, another fact yep. that we must add is yes. Your face is out there. We are increasingly, you know, I think it was Andy Warhol who said, now everybody will have 15 minutes of fame. We're increasingly arriving at a world where everyone in some way is going to be recognizable yeah. right, in one of these databases. But living an anonymous life is almost impossible if you are living in modern society. Right. And to me, a little twist in the knife with this, this is being sold at a profit and none of the, no one is being compensated. So for instance, every time Matt's uh, image shows up and it's a false positive, every time that, that one resource that is entirely created by him shows up in, you know, APD, hmm. FBI, etc. He, he doesn't get any uh, royalty from that. No. And I don't, I, I 
for the record, I completely think that will never actually happen. No, if, if we ever see a, a time where the FBI opens up a fun and zany FBI t-shirt store where you can get your photo <laughs> stored that was stored on the law enforcement database onto a t-shirt and maybe as a mug shot or something. That's a great idea. Oh, man. Oh, on a coffee mug. Yeah. yeah. A mug shot. A yeah. coffee mug shot. So let's – uh well, let's as as they like to say, let's embiggen this. All right, I I, I think that's a cromulent decision. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. So we're we're talking right now about the United States, yes, which it does have an extensive network, as you said, an extensive array of networks. Mm -hmm. But my question is, when it runs into like multinational private industry, mm -hmm. does it also run into international law enforcement, like Interpol? <laughs> I mean, really, you, if you don't think agencies like the Central Intelligence Agency have their own versions of this database that incorporate people from all over the world, you're absolutely wrong. Uh -huh. I mean, it has to, right? Like, and in some point, in some aspects, you understand, right? You're talking about trying to protect national interests from very flexible, very mobile, uh, very agile mm -hmm. enemies, Yes, essentially, or, or agents, if you want to call them that, whether they're state agents or otherwise. So you understand, you understand the necessity. The problem is, again, unless you have a clear set of rules, you know, you have some transparency there on how it operates and you have the ability to actually put your technology to the test to show that it is in fact accurate. Ultimately, you're left with a question of, do we, did we get the right person? Right. This leads to deaths. If we, if we get the wrong person, two things happen. The bad guy got away, uh -huh. right? Because you didn't get the person you wanted to get and you've given the bad guys more reason to hate you because you are targeting people who are innocent. You are creating more bad guys, right? Right. If you go out there and you are targeting people who are are innocent of the crimes that, that you think they committed because you're following a wrong lead due to a technological glitch, mm -hmm. then you are justifying that anti-sentiment because you are doing what you have been accused of doing, which is coming into another culture and disrupting it. Mm -hmm. So this is true whether it's domestically and we're talking about people who are disproportionately targeted by law enforcement because of this sort of same sort of issue or on a global scale. Moreover, there are other nations that have even more pervasive camera technologies built around them than the United States does. Hello, England. Right. I love you, but I can't go anywhere without being on a camera in England. Right. Don't they have the highest density of CCTV? They certainly did, at least for a long time. I don't know if they currently hold that record, but they for for a long time, like especially in London, mm -hmm. uh, because they had so many different CCTV systems that were most of them were, were self-contained. Sure. Right. So. Like like a, a shop owner has a a security camera. camera. Yeah. yeah, essentially that's what it was. Uh, so it wasn't like it was just this vast network. Uh, apart from what you know, you would see like in in um, Sherlock, where Mycroft is able to zoom in on Watson wherever he goes because he can tap into every camera that's on every street corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's one thing because those were those were streets, so mm. those would presumably be operated by by the government itself, uh, or at least some branch of the government. But you wouldn't be able to necessarily tap into like every every store's feed because it's a self-contained system. It's not connected to a network. For now. For now. Which brings us to, of course. The, the future? Yes. Okay. The, the very last part, uh, speculation. Um, speculation, educated guesses. Where is this going? So on the one hand, I am somewhat encouraged in the United States that a lot of focus has been brought to this matter. Uh, along with the Government Accountability Office and Georgetown University, you have Congress actually taking the FBI to task about this. Obviously, there would need to be a lot more of those sort of discussions at all levels of government for that to actually lead to uh, regulations and transparency. Mm hmm I think it's a good start. I do not know if it's going to have enough momentum to carry it forward to prevent massive abuse of this kind of technology on multiple levels. Because, I mean, that's happening right now. I don't know if it'll curtail it. Um, I hope it will. That's one possible future is that we'll see over time 
the development of these rules and policies that various agencies have to follow so that the use of this technology is done in an accountable and responsible way. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, you know, the FBI, they state that when they're running these searches, any search result they get back, that does not mean the person that they get has become a suspect. It means that they have a match that a potential lead to follow. They're very careful in their wording <laughs> to say that they haven't identified a suspect. That's why they use probe photo rather than suspect photo. However, words only go so far. Mm-hmm. How, where do the actions go? And that's the big fear is that we don't really know yet. So optimist Jonathan sure. would say over time we develop these rules. We hold these uh, agencies accountable for them. We make certain that no one is relying too heavily on a technology that is not perfect. Uh-huh. And it just becomes another another tool of agencies to use for specific situations in order to investigate leads. And that is as far as it goes. Cynical Jonathan. I'm more familiar with this one. Yeah. Cynical Jonathan thinks this is going to continue largely unchecked at various levels of law enforcement uh, uh, agencies, including the federal level. Largely used in, in agencies that have no transparency because of the nature of what they do, things like the NSA. And that there will be a growing number of people very much interested in using it for purposes that it was not intended. In other words, not to investigate crimes alone. I mean, they would still want to use it for that, obviously, uh-huh. but also to perhaps push specific political agendas by suppressing uh, opposing political agendas. And this sounds very Orwellian mm-hmm. and very like, I'm not, again, I'm not an Orwellian type of dystopia person, but it makes it so easy to do that even if you weren't consciously setting out on that path, you could do it just by happenstance of your other methods of going about your business. And because we have no rules or regulations for it, right. there's no protection against it. So I find it very concerning. I, I think it needs to be addressed and and it needs to be consistently looked at as something that we have to fix. Because if we don't, the abuse of it is going to be rampant. It's going to be disruptive. And I mean, if you are not a member of whichever privileged group is not consistently targeted by this right you might not see a problem with it but for everybody else it's it's a huge it's unfair it's a threat it's not cool uh so yeah i'm i'm afraid we're going to a real dark place and it's literally stuff they don't want you to know when you talk about where this data goes where it's aggregated who's talking to whom Mm -hmm. right this is this is not only I don't know. I think you make an important point when you say it's not illegal because there's no measure of legality yet, but legal and ethical are not always the same. Oh, sure. No, I mean, there are plenty of things that uh, I think you could argue are unethical that are perfectly legal and sure. vice versa. There are some things that you might argue are illegal, but are perfectly ethical. Right. Like it's legal to uh, sing that journey song at karaoke, but is it ethical? I would think not. That I would think at this point, it's don't not. stop believing has been overdone. <laughs> <laughs> Go with a different journey song. So at this point, we've talked about the past, the present, and the possible future of mm-hmm. facial recognition. And, and Jonathan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and illuminating us, choosing that word very carefully, uh, with with the facts behind something that, that people hear about in this amorphous boogeyman sort of way. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that even when you shed this light on it for us, it's still a boogeyman. Oh, yeah. No, this is this is something that is happening it's happening without any real oversight. It It is certainly incorporating uh, data from people who have no criminal background whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And it is 
it's very disturbing. Like it's it's one thing if everyone were to go with the rules that the FBI originally set, which uh-huh. is that we're only using the data that we've collected from criminal cases. Even then you could argue, well, we don't necessarily know that everybody who's in that criminal <laughs> database actually did something criminal. There might be some innocent people in there. In fact, there probably are some innocent people in there. And you're also missing out on everybody who has yet to commit a crime. But that that part would be less concerning from the average citizen, right, Matt? I mean, if you're FBI, you hate it because yeah. it makes it harder for you to find a lead. But if you're an average citizen, you're relieved because you know you're not going to get targeted. But the problem is that no, th- those rules, that's not what everyone's following. People are right. – in fact, we don't know what everyone is doing and it's terrifying because – you are it, you, there's no way of knowing how frequently your face has already been in virtual lineups. It probably has been at some point. It may have been that it reached a very early stage before it was dismissed yeah. and never went further than that. But right now, as we're talking, as your listeners are listening to this, there are cold algorithms looking for that numeric match and your face might be it. And that reminds me. Uh, do you guys want to take a picture for Instagram after we uh, after we close the show? Uh, Not really. Does it have to be of us? <laughs> we cover Good our question. faces. <laughs> all right, we'll break out eye patches or something. Maybe uh, this is all true. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is there is an active collection of groups that are cooperating using your data in what could be and what have been very dangerous ways, and. Jonathan, I think you've ended it for us on the perfect note because this is only, weirdly enough, the beginning. So if people want to learn more about not just this, but all, all things tech related, could, could you tell us where to check you out? Absolutely. I host the podcast Tech Stuff. Uh, we, uh, we publish twice a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. We cover all sorts of technology topics from things that are scary, like I did a recent episode about near misses with nuclear war, uh, the times when we were the world was on the brink of nuclear devastation and cooler heads prevailed, uh-huh. because clearly that did not happen. Uh, but I also do fun, silly stuff. I did one that was all about uh, the top memes of the last few years, so mm-hmm. talking about where those came from and and uh and and how they evolved over time. So it's the whole gambit of technology stories. So if you want to check that out, go to your favorite podcatching service such as uh, iTunes Podcasts and listen to tech stuff if you like it, subscribe. If you really like it, you can watch me record it live cuz I'm doing something crazy on Wednesdays and Fridays over at twitch.tv/techstuff. I live stream the recording sessions of my show so you can go and watch me record live and here's the cool thing or lame thing depending upon your point of view you can witness all the times i mess up or have to take a break or have to cough or have to drink some water or whatever it may be because it's live it's all the (laughs) stuff that we cut out before we publish the show you can witness it and you can say i heard that show a month before it published because that's how far (laughs) out i am that's fantastic. And, and I think Matt sometimes helps you produce that. Is that correct? He does. Matt has, I have pulled Matt in on multiple occasions to help set up the, both the recording and the Twitch streaming side of that. Uh, Matt has appeared on camera briefly as part of that. I don't make him stay for the whole thing because he's got, turns out he's got stuff to do. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. So, uh, do check out Jonathan on that. If you are interested in the future of technology and want to feel a little bit better about the state of humanity, then check out Jonathan's other show, Forward Thinking, which is available on YouTube. And the Facebooks. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to see my face getting identified all over the place, <laughs> check out Forward Thinking. Yeah. That one's, that one's kind of like the, the shiny, happy cousin. To stuff they don't want you to know is dark, dark emo cousin, I think. We prefer to think of it as conspiracy realism. I Look, I'm not making any kind of judgments here. I'm merely making an observation. I love all the children of how stuff works equally. <laughs> All right. Well, now we're definitely putting a picture of you on Instagram. And you may be asking yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, wait. 
The guys have an Instagram? Oh my gosh, OMG, where can I find it? Well, the answer is Conspiracy Stuff Show. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter where we are Conspiracy Stuff. And And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.